My thought shall never be that you are dead, Who laugh so lightly in this quiet place; The dear and deep dyed humour of that face Held something ever living in death's stead. Scornful I hear the flat things they have said, And all their piteous platitudes of pain. I laugh, I laugh, for you will come again. This heart would never beat if you were dead. The world's a drowse in twilight hushfulness; There's purple lilac in your little room, And somewhere out beyond the evening gloom Small boys are culling your summer watercress. Of these familiar things I have no dread, Being so very sure you are not dead. Now when we look at this poem, I think the first thing we need to do Is look at the title. The title says Reported Missing. Obviously this is a military term, Reported Missing, Presumed Dead. But the poet, Anna Gordon Keown, has taken it to mean just merely missing, not yet dead. And that faces the whole of the poem. She feels certain that he isn't dead. And in fact, she goes as far as to say the reason she knows he's not dead is because she wouldn't be living if he were dead. She starts clearly by saying, my thoughts will never be that you are dead. I can never imagine, possibly, I can't even begin to contemplate the concept that you could possibly be dead. Because only just recently you were laughing, happy, smiling. And looking away the way the um, poet starts the poem with a very clear, simple diction, simple language that everybody can understand. She then moves on to use alliteration in the second line. I laughed so lately, just adding that sort of sense of, not that long ago, he was laughing, happy, full of life. The dear and deep-eyed humour of that face. Notice the continued alliteration of dear and deep, and the D in humour, sorry, in eyed, followed on by later on by death's dead, duh, duh, again following in quick succession. I'm trying to say that this person couldn't possibly be dead, because it's kind of like a life force. It's full of life, full of energy, full of happiness. And she goes on to be scornful of what other people might well say. Is look, other people are saying things like, you know, uh, we all go through it, it's a dreadful thing, you'll get over it one day. But she's saying, look, he's not dead. He says those platitudes, those cliches. No, I don't have to worry about those cliches because he isn't dead. And notice the way that she spits out those words, piteous platitude of pain, the alliteration of the p, 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 these plosives, spitting out what she's saying, adding to that feeling of scorn. I laugh, I laugh, she says, and it's almost like it's all too much. And here we have this important rhyme, don't we? For you will come again. And she's rhymed, she was rhymed pain and again in quick success. That rhyming of pain and again in quick succession gives us a real sort of sense of the tightness of the rhyme and the importance of the fact that both she is in, if she thinks about him actually dying, she will be in pain. She will be in pain. Instead we get the hysterical, I laugh, I laugh. She's in utter denial. She refuses to admit that he could possibly be dead. And we wonder who she's convincing. Is she convincing the reader or is she convincing herself? She says, this heart would never beat if you were dead. We would be so utterly distraught that she would die immediately if he were to die. He were dead. But she could not go in living. That sort of sense that they are both entwined. And then we move on to the final part of the poem, which is, is full of sort of now, and you can imagine that there she is in the twilight, contemplating the fact that of his absence, it's all about his absence, isn't it? His room has the lilac, that very strong smelling um, uh, fragrant blossom, so we, we're dealing with sort of springtime, something like that. And then the boys are out there, cutting down some more summer watercress, something he may well have been doing all too recently, with the fact that I remember, of course, that he, he's a young lad, he's gone off to fight. And that's that word culling. Culling is a word we associate, associate with death, with killing, in mass numbers. It's not the usual word we'd use to describe cutting summer watercress. And she says, I don't have any fear about any of these things because I know you're not dead. Because if he were dead, all this would frighten me. All these simple everyday things would frighten me. And that's what makes this poem so sad. It's the effect on the people back home. She was stuck at home. 
She didn't get the chance to fight. Instead, she had to sit and wait and hear the dreadful news. And we can think about plenty of other poems in which this has also been the case. Spring in wartime. Um, perhaps. Even the hero. They all discuss what it's like for the people left back at home. This has been my first podcast. I hope it's been useful. Please contact me at school if you have any ideas for improvements, or if you have any ideas, any feedback at all. I'd be very, very grateful. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope it's of some use. So, check out the VLE under resources. There's plenty more things that we can use, and turn up to all the masterclasses. Thank you.